Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Free Fall Slack course. In this chapter, we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of this course. The way that we're going to go about this course is that we're going to create our backend first. And for those of you that have not uh, any experience in creating backends, um, what you really do is just you first pick a technology or a framework uh, such, such as Node.js, and then you have to look at the language. Uh, the programming language that that technology or framework uses. Node.js, as its name indicates, uses JavaScript. And the technology or the framework that I've chosen for this course for creating our backend is called Django. And Django depends on Python. So Python uh, is a general purpose programming language, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, that is available on many computers and many different hardware combinations. It's even available on Raspberry Pi, for instance. So uh, you can do pretty much anything with Python. And with the recent developments, Python's even available uh, as a scripting language on the web, just like JavaScript. So um, with Django being the technology or the framework that we're going to use to create our REST APIs in this, uh, in this course, it's very important that we learn about Python as well, and what Python actually means for this course, how much knowledge you have to have from before, <clears throat> from working with Python in order, in order to be able to progress with this course. Even though I actually assume very little knowledge of programming languages in general for progressing with this course, but I, I still believe that it's important that you have just a little bit of knowledge, at least know like what functions are variables are in constants or et cetera, et cetera. So Python being the language that we're going to use for creating our backend and REST APIs, it's important that we dive deeper into it and lay a good foundation for the rest of the chapters. Uh, even though that's not what we're going to do in this chapter, we're just mainly going to be talking about what we're going to do in the rest of the chapters. But the chapters that follow this one are going to lay the foundations for actually working with Python. And we're going to go through many, many different types of uh, chapters where we talk about variables, functions, and you name it, and pretty much anything that's needed for being able to continue with the rest of the chapters. So um, if you haven't worked with Python from before, that's completely fine. I'm going to walk you through some crash courses. Uh, we're going to have, I think, more than five chapters where we dive deep into Python. So I'm not going to assume any previous knowledge about Python, but it's important that you keep an open eye for and an open heart mainly for Python and learning it because uh, that's at least what I can suggest to anyone trying to learn a new programming language. Just go into it with an open heart and an open mind and um, your experience hopefully will be a lot easier down the line. So Python is the programming language that we're going to use for our backend. So we can't say that our backend is in Python. Uh, that's that's as vague as saying uh, that our backend is in JavaScript. Python is the programming language. However, Django is going to be the framework uh, on the backend that allows us then to create the REST APIs. Django itself, it's actually interesting because Django itself is kind of like a technology or a framework for creating websites. And it gives you a very nice separation of um, responsibilities between different layers of your backend. However, Django itself isn't going to be delivering the REST APIs for our backend as we're going to develop in this course. We're going to be using a framework called DRF in short, which is Django REST framework, which sits on top of Django. As we'll get more and more into Django, you'll understand that it's a very general purpose backend website development framework. Uh, and Django REST framework that then sits on top of Django, which itself sits on top of Python, allows us to create very nice REST APIs with documentations and everything. So if you're unfamiliar with backend development and with website development, et cetera, just know for now that we're going to be using Python as the programming language for creating our backend. We're going to be using Django as the framework that uses Python in order to run our backend server. And we're going to be using DRF or Django REST framework that sits on top of Django in order to deliver our REST APIs. 
Python, being a programming language, can have its own installation and actually should have its own installation on the target operating system. So if you have Mac, Windows, or Linux, then you're going to have an installation for Python in order to be able to work with Python. Python, you can have multiple versions of that on your computer. So you can have version 3.10.1, 3.10.2, or you can have one of the two versions on your computer. And it is very important that you work with the correct version of Python for your backend development. And what, what I mean by correct is that by starting a backend uh, application with Python and Django and DRF, you need to commit to a Python version. As you read the documentations for Python, you'll see that some APIs are available only in specific versions of Python and upwards, just like many other programming languages, pretty much every other programming language, Swift, Rust, you name it. And by committing to a version, you need to ensure that your application always runs only on that version and no other versions at all. Since we're going to create a backend, we need to deploy that backend to a server on the cloud so that our users can actually consume that. Later in this chapter, sorry, later in this course, actually, we're going to be developing applications using Flutter and Rust that consume our APIs and can deliver an experience to our users. These applications need to be able to access our server. If you're familiar with client development, such as app development, for instance, with Flutter or native iOS or Android, you know that the code that you write most probably will be compiled either on your own computer or one of your colleagues' computer. Or if you have a system set up for, for CD and CI, maybe using Fastlane, it will be running on Circle CI and creating a build. So it's also important there as a client developer to decide which version of Swift, for instance, you're using, which version of Xcode should be available on the target computer to run your code and build your code. It's no different on the server side. By committing to a version of Python, you're basically guarding yourself against, for instance, running your code on a computer where the target um, where the target operating system doesn't contain the required Python version. And you could get into all sorts of problems, compilation errors, maybe even hidden, some hidden errors that you couldn't expect from before. PyEnv is an application that you will run on your computer, for instance, that will allow you to manage multiple versions of Python. So you can tell PyEnv that, hey, for this particular application, I want to use this Python version. But when I switch to another application, I want a different Python version. If you don't use PyEnv, you have to manage all of this manually. And that is a task that is almost impossible. The reason we need PyEnv is an automated way for you to target a specific version of Python for your backend. This shouldn't be such a difficult concept to actually understand. Because if you have knowledge from client development, for instance, from before, even when you're doing, for instance, uh, development with .NET or you're doing development with Rust or any other programming language or framework, you need to always ensure that you're running on the correct version. And by correct, I don't mean that there is one version globally that is correct for your development. What I mean is that you need to target a specific version and you need to stick to that version. If you're compiling your code on another computer or on a server, you need to ensure that that server or that computer has that version of your SDK or your programming language available so that the compilation will go also smoothly. PyEnv internally has something called shims. And I can show you here, perhaps, let's do some screen reshuffling here. I will do that and I will go here and into terminal. So here we have terminal. And if I type in here, which Python, you can see that it says Python is available as part of PyEnv and a folder called shims and then Python. So shims is just a fancy name for kind of like an alias. So what happens is that PyEnv, dependent on your environment, 
that you're working with. Here, for instance, I've told PyEnv that globally I want to have a specific version of Python. What PyEnv creates is an alias, puts that inside a shims folder, and this Python here then internally refers to one of the installed versions of Python inside PyEnv. So if I say in here Python version, you can see that I'm using version 3.10.2. And this Python, and this Python shim in here is just an alias to where that Python installation actually is. As we'll talk more and more about uh, PyEnv, uh, I'll tell you more, more about shims and how they work, how versions work with PyEnv. So don't worry about that. In the coming chapters, we're actually going to go through installation of PyEnv installation of Python and pip and all that stuff. So for now, don't worry about it. Just know that if you see the, the word shims, it simply means that PyM's alias to specific versions of Python. I'm going to do some more reshuffling in here so that we can continue talking about some of the other topics that I prepared for this chapter. So as you'll work with Python, you'll also understand that there's something in, in the Python installations usually called pip. And pip is the package installer for Python, as you can see at the bottom of the screen. Again, this shouldn't be a surprise for you if you're familiar with, for instance, Flutter development, where you have your pop spec, or if you're a native iOS developer, there you can have Swift Package Manager or CocoaPods. Or if you're an Android developer, there you have Gradle. So you have Rust. If you're a Rust developer, you'll have Cargo. And so it's pr pretty much all modern programming languages come with their own package install or package manager. So you, if you're, for instance, working with Node, you have Node Package Manager, NPM as well. So I'm just trying to give you some examples so that maybe you can relate to what pip is. Pip is to Python. Uh, what Swift Package Manager is to Swift, or what your pop spec YAML file is to your Flutter application, or Cargo is to Rust, and NPM is to Node.js applications. It allows you to drag in external dependencies into your applications. We will be using pip quite a lot, actually, in this course where we're developing our backend. So just know that if you see pip, it means that we're just adding and installing some third-party, usually third-party dependencies into our application. When we go and start learning more and more about Python in this course, we'll run our applications or run our Python code mainly in an application called IPython, which is basically an interactive Python shell. So Python in the terminal itself is quite interactive. So let's back, let's go back in here to Python. I'll do some screen reshuffling again in here. So in here, if I type Python, you can see that I actually come into the REPL for Python, and I can actually start typing things in here. So I can say foo is equal to foo, for instance. I can say print foo, and you can see that the results are then printed to the screen. And I can then type exit in here, and I exit the Python shell in here ipython however it's its own uh, application is a REPL as well so it allows you to run python code interactively so in here if i say foo is equal to vandat for instance and if i say print foo in here you can see if i press the tab for instance button on my keyboard then i can get some suggestions in here and you can see if i press tab in here then i can get suggestions as to foo or using format so IPython is pretty much Python's REPL on steroids. So it allows you, it gives you code completion. It gives you like later when we start talking about classes, etc. it will give you information about the class, uh, uh, the classes implementations as well. So it is just a nicer shell or REPL on top of Python. And we will talk a lot more about IPython and how to use it in the later chapters. But for now, know that IPython is a program that we will install on our computers using pip, which is the package installer for Python. So first, if you look at the hierarchy, we have to use pyenv. We have to install pyenv so that we can manage our Python versions. Using pyenv, we will install Python. 
With Python, we will get pip, which is the package installer for Python. And using pip, we will install IPython. So a lot going on. But still, when you get more and more into backend development, you will know that this is completely normal. It's, it's like when, even when you're using Node.js, then you have your Node.js, and you have to learn JavaScript. Then Node.js is like your framework for running your uh, backend. And then with Node.js, you have NPM. You download your dependency. So lots and lots are going to go on when you're using when you're doing backend development. And you just have to you just have to go with it. There's really not so much alternatives out there. And Installing packages and dependencies is a completely normal thing on your backend applications, as long as you know what the risks are and as long as you install dependencies that you and other developers actually can trust. And that's something that trust is something that you build in the community and you learn more and more about it as you go on. So it's my, my motto for this is just have an open heart and uh, an open mind. But as well, don't be naive and don't drag in dependencies for no reason. Okay, so that's short about IPython as well. So I'll do some reshuffling again in here. Okay, so we will be using this setup for um, for Linux and Windows and uh, Mac OS, of course. So I'm going to walk you through the steps, not in this chapter, but in the coming chapters. I'm going to walk you through the steps required to install all these dependencies. In this course, in this entire course, we're going to be using Python, Rust, and Dart as the programming languages for the things that we're going to deliver. On top of Python, we're going to use Django and Django REST framework to deliver our backend. On top of Dart, we're going to use Flutter to deliver our iOS and Android applications. And for Rust, we're just going to be using Rust. Of course, we're going to be using some third-party packages in order to be able to talk to our backend as well. But I'm not going to go into that right now. But just know that for Rust, our setup is a lot easier. It's going to be just Rust and Cargo. And of course, we're going to be using Clippy to help us with uh, our syntax in Rust. So, But that's nothing you have to worry about right now. In this course, I'm going to teach you how to add all these packages and dependencies and frameworks to your target operating systems. And we're going to do it on three operating systems, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. I actually think the order that I usually do is Mac OS, Linux, and then Windows, I believe. So some chapters are, are going to be duplicated in that we'll have one chapter dedicated to installing IPython, Python, <clears throat> excuse me, et cetera, on Mac OS. And we'll have the exact same chapter that talks about installing all those dependencies and programs on Linux, and again, a duplication of that for Windows users. But I've decided to do that simply because I've had a look at the analytics for my YouTube channel, I can, and I can actually see a lot of you are on Windows and Linux machines. So I think it will be a lot more fair if I spend some time teaching about installing all these dependencies and tools on your favorite operating system before we go on and actually use these tools, OK? So that was a lot of talking, a lot of preparation. But this course is going to be actually very long. So I hope that you can get used to me rambling on and talking. But I think it's very important that we lay a good foundation before we continue with the rest of the course. So I hope that you enjoyed this chapter. And I'll see you in the next one.